favorite stories. It is a story of miraculous deliverance. It is a story of some unusual events, and it has some amazing salvation parallels that we can draw out in the light of the story of Jesus and what he does for us. Second Kings chapter 7. It is taken from one of the darkest periods in Israel's history. Uh, they, have been, they have been under the continual attack of the nation of Assyria. You will recall that there were a few major nations that oppressed Israel throughout its history. The first, of course, was Egypt, and then came Assyria. And then there were some of the nations around them, like the Philistines, which weren't quite as bad as some of these other big nations, Assyria, and then Babylon, and then Medo-Persia, and then Greece, and then Rome, and so on and so forth. And so here we are, quite relatively early in the history of Israel, maybe actually about halfway through, and the Syrians have come up and have attacked uh, this little town, this town, the city, uh, that um, city of Israel. And so we read here from Second Kings chapter 7, verse 3, and it says the following. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. Uh, and they said to one another, Why are we sitting here until we die? Okay, pause there for a second. What's going on here? Syria has come up and is besieging the city of Samaria, right? Now, the way they did war back then was that they all lived behind gated communities, cities with big walls. You did your agriculture on the outside of the city, uh, and that's where you would do your farming and that kind of thing. And then at night or when there was threat, you would all withdraw into the city, lock this big solid wooden gates or metal gates or whatever they were, and then you would then you would be on the inside. You would have your granaries and your storage on the inside. You would store up water on the inside. And so you could, you could literally hang out in the city. The idea was that you would uh, build up a reservoir or a, a, uh, a storehouse for exactly a time such as this. So when the enemy arrived and there was no gunpowder or nuclear bombs or anything like that that we have today, what would they have to do? They'd have to climb the walls. Well, while they're climbing the walls, what happens to their soldiers? Stuff gets dropped on them. They get shot by arrows, etc., etc. So what the enemy would do was they would besiege the city. They would just camp outside. They would make sure no one goes out. They would make sure no one goes in. And they could camp there for two or three years, waiting for the people inside the city to become desperate enough to either surrender or go all out into battle because they're going to die anyway. And so here the Syrians are, surrounded the city. They've obviously been there for a long time. Their food has run out. Their water is running out. People are literally dying from starvation inside of the city. On the outside of the city are a, are a group of men. These men have leprosy. Leprosy had no cure in those days. It was regarded almost as a judgment from God. It was as if you'd been touched by the finger of God. And so if you were a leper, then you were constrained to leave your family, leave society, leave town and get out of there. And you'd go live in a cave somewhere with a group of other lepers in a leper colony. And you would just watch each other die one by one. So these men are citizens of the city that's under attack, but they're not inside the city because... They have been suffering outside of the city since even before the siege began. Does that make sense to you? But the Syrians are their enemies, just like the Syrians are the enemies of the people inside of the city. So these men are thinking, if we say that we will enter the city, so if we decide we're going to go into the city, we will die there. There's no food inside there. They're all starving to death anyway. Because the famine is in the city. If we sit here, what happens to us? We die anyway. So they're thinking to each other, I wonder if there's a third option. Now therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. That's the enemy, right? Let's go and surrender ourselves to the enemy. Because at the end of the day, if they keep us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall only die. So we're going to die anyway if we go into the city. We're going to die anyway if we stay here. We might as well give ourselves into the hands of our enemy and just see what happens. Probably they're going to kill us. But hey, we don't have any other options. We're going to die anyway. But maybe there's a small chance they'll keep us alive, in which case we'll survive. So let's go and hand ourselves over to the enemy. Verse 5, they rose at twilight. That's sort of as it's getting dark, you know, they don't want to see, they don't want their brothers inside the city to see what they're doing. So under the cover of darkness, off they go. They rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. 
For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of the chariots, the noise of the horses, the noise of a great army. So the Syrians said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. Now, when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent and ate and drank and carried from it silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came back, entered another tent and carried some from there also and went and hid it. Then they said to one another, wait a second, we are not doing what is right. This day is a day of good news and we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. So they went and called to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, saying, We went to the Syrian camp, and surprisingly, no one was there. Not a human sound, only horses and donkeys tied, tents intact. The gatekeepers called out, and they told it to the king's household inside. The king arose in the night and said to his servants, Now, I'll tell you what these Syrians are up to. They know that we are hungry. Therefore, they've gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, when, when, when the Sumerians, when we, coming out of Samaria, when we come out of the city, they will catch us alive and come into the city. So he thought it was a military strategy, a trick. And by the way, this was a, a used military strategy in those days. In fact, this is, interestingly enough, a little bit how Jerusalem fell in 70 AD. One of his servants answered and said, Please, let several men take five of the remaining horses which are left in the city. Look, they may either become like all the multitude of Israel that are left in it, or indeed I say they may become like all the multitude of Israel left from those who are consumed. So let us send them and see. In other words, we've got nothing to lose. Send five men, five horses. If they don't come back, they don't come back. What have we lost? Therefore they took two chariots with horses, and the king sent them in the direction of the Syrian army, saying, Go and see. And they went after them to the Jordan. And indeed, all the road was full of garments and weapons, which the Syrians had thrown away in their haste. So the messengers returned to, and told the king. Then the people went out and plundered the tents of the Syrians. So a sea of fine flour, that's about 6.4 liters, a sea of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two seas of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Very interesting story. Because throughout Scripture... Food, feeding ourselves, drink, drinking for ourselves is equated to spiritual nourishment. Jesus comes along and he calls himself the bread of heaven. He says he is the water of life. Does that make sense? The, the, the story in the Old Testament about the Israelites when they're rescued from Egypt and they're led out into the wilderness and God feeds them miraculously with manna that comes down from heaven. Jesus applies that to himself. The physical bread which came down from heaven is what he says. I am that in a spiritual sense. Where does the water come from? Well, the people got hun hung uh, thirsty in the wilderness. And so what did he tell Moses to do? strike the rock. The first time in the beginning of the 40 years, he brought them to a place and Moses was to strike the rock. The rock split open, water gushed out. It was a symbol that Jesus would be broken on the cross. He would be struck down by the judgment of God and from that cross would flow forth the waters, the living waters. 40 years later, after the wilderness wanderings, just before they go into Canaan, God brings them full circle back to the rock. This time he says to Moses, do not strike the rock, speak to the rock. Moses, of course, struck the rock in his frustration. The illustration Jesus was trying to bring forth is if he is the rock, you know there's texts in the Bible that say that, right? God is our refuge and strength. God is our rock, right? So if Jesus is the rock who was struck on the cross, then when you and I come to him in prayer and speak to him because he was already broken under the rod of judgment exercised by the Father upon the cross, when you speak to him and plead for his blessings, the water flows again in real time in your life from heaven to earth. Jesus is the bread of heaven. He is the water of life. Here are hungry men and they are dying for the lack of bread. 
Yes, this was a literal story. Yes, it is many thousands of years ago, but it is still relevant today. Here is a group of people, and they are starving to death. They are under siege. They are being attacked by the enemy. The result is that because of the enemy camped around the outskirts of the town, they have locked themselves behind their walled gates. They have, they have turned to their own works to deliver themselves. They have built the city by their strength. They have gone inside of the city. They have locked the doors. But despite the best attempts of their hands, they cannot gain the victory. They are starving to death in the presence of the enemy. What they don't know, what they don't know is that there has been a divine miracle outside the city of their own devising, outside the walls built by their own hands, outside the attempt to save themselves. There is a miracle that God has already done. The enemy has fled. The enemy has fled. He's already a defeated foe. Outside the city of Jerusalem, Christ was crucified upon the cross. He was dragged outside. He was nailed to that cross. A divine miracle has taken, taken place. And many of us do not understand that. We're still trying to save ourselves by the city of our own devising. Locked behind our own walls. Trying to spare ourselves and save ourselves. And we're starving to death. We're thirsting to death. Inside that city they turned on each other. When a miracle had already happened outside of the city. Four men desperate. Four men so desperate that they realize they have nothing to lose. Venture into the unknown. And what do they discover? They discover in their attempt to surrender. Giving themselves over for life or for death. It doesn't matter to them. They don't care anymore. They're giving themselves over. And in the moment of surrender, they discover the miracle. They discover that God has caused a miracle to take place and the enemy is a defeated foe. They walk into the tents of the enemy and, and that psalm, the psalm of David, the, the good shepherd is fulfilled right there. He prepares a banquet table in the presence of my enemy. They find bread, they find water, they find treasure. They take treasure out of the hands of the enemy. They are suddenly rich because of the miracle of God. They are suddenly fed because of the miracle of God. They are suddenly full of drink because of the miracle of God. And for a moment there, as they're enjoying the blessings of God, glad to be alive, thankful to be alive, for a moment there they forget about their brethren suffering. A church perhaps that's not witnessing and suddenly they come to their senses and they realize God has redeemed us this day. They realize the miracle that they're enjoying here. And suddenly they realize others are dying for a lack of what we have. They return to their brethren. They go to the city. They pronounce the good news. They preach the message. Some are thinking this is too good to be true. Can it really be like this? Is, is this possible? I'm sure this is a trap. No, we're telling you God has worked a miracle. There is deliverance outside of your man-made walls. There is deliverance outside of your gates. Open the gates. Come out. Celebrate with us. A miracle has taken place. The enemy is a defeated foe. No, we can't believe it. It can't be true. This is a trap of the enemy. No, God has worked a miracle. There is salvation. Venture the risk. Walk outside of your own means of saving yourself. Those defense mechanisms you put up for yourselves. That, that, that inability to trust because you've been hurt before. Let the guard down. Break the walls down. Walk out. Trust yourself to Jesus. Because he's worked a miracle and he's prepared a table. The bread is on the table. The water is on the table. Everything is prepared. But you've got to be willing to trust him to leave the devisings of your own hands. The, the, the methods by which we protect ourselves. The, the, the way in which we defend ourselves. We don't let anybody in. We don't go out. We protect ourselves. We don't trust. We don't risk. Because yes, life has messed us up. We project that onto God. We think if people are untrustworthy, if people betray us, can we really trust God? Can we really be vulnerable with Him? 
And until we come to the place where we are willing to leave that little walled, gated community of trust in ourselves because I'm the only one that can't hurt myself, yet in that very philosophy I'm dying within me for lack of the bread of life, for lack of the water of life. Strange thing is my attempt to protect and save myself is the very thing that's causing me to starve to death within myself. When a miracle has already been performed outside of the city of my own devising. How many choose to stay in that city? To stay in that place of self-dependence, of self-reliance, of self-trust. How many people die in that place when the miracle has already been provided? I want you to understand that these men that discovered this amazing thing, the reason that they discovered it, follow their logic. Follow their logic. If we stay here, we are dead anyway. If we go into the city, we are dead anyway. Let us take this unlikely opportunity, this unlikely scenario. The chances are we're going to end up dead, but no worse off than what we would have been before. In fact, if they kill us, at least it will be quick rather than the slow, slow, painful death of starvation. They realize that they have nothing to lose. They realize that they have nothing to hold on to. They realize that they are dead any way. I want to suggest to you this morning that that's what it takes to surrender to Jesus. The realization that you are dead anyway. All your defense mechanisms, all your self-trust, all your looking inward, all your attitudes of, I can do this, I, will, I can't rely on anyone else, I can't rely on God, it's going to kill you. Surrender is the fundamental ingredient that leads to life. The willingness to step outside of the walls of your own works, the, 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 the willingness to venture and to trust yourself into the hands of God, to say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to, let, I'm going to trust you. And the day you do that, you will find, you will taste, you will see that everything that needs to be done has been done. God has worked a miracle. The enemy is a defeated foe. I want to take you to a verse, to, to a chapter in Psalms. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. And I love this psalm because in Psalm 139, you get a picture of the intimacy between God and His people. You get a picture of how interested God is in you, how interested He is in me, how interested He is in us, how well He knows us, how comprehensively He understands us. In Psalm 139, you get this idea of the omniscience of God, that He knows everything about us, even the words we speak before we speak them, the days that are fashioned for us before we experience them. He knows everything. He has foreknowledge, and He is everywhere. There is nowhere you can go to get away from God. A beautiful pre uh, picture of the presence the knowledge and the closeness of God to humanity. So I'm just going to read this and you follow along in your Bible. Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and you have known me. You know my sitting down. You know my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take, my, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Your right hand shall hold me, and if I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night around about me shall be light. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and my soul knows this very well. 
My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in, the secret, in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, the number of times God thinks about it is, if I should count them, they would be more in number than the sands of the sea. And when I awake, I am still with you. Jump down to 23. Search me, O God, and know me. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Isn't that an amazing picture of God? An amazing picture of a God who knows you better than you know yourself. And yet, despite the fact that He knows you this well, He has performed a miracle in your behalf. He is willing to redeem you, to, to transform you, to take you from the place where you are dying from starvation, spiritually speaking, and to feed you with the bounties of heaven. And all this because or despite the fact that He knows you. Now, why do I say despite the fact that He knows you? You know, when you build human relationships... You always put your best foot forward, don't you? I mean, that's how most of us, we want to win people's confidence. How do you win people's confidence? Through bad behavior? No. You win people's confidence by being friendly, putting a smile on your face, by being respectful. You win people's confidence by putting your best foot forward, so to speak. Is that right? You know what the problem is, though? When I build relationships on that assumption or with those bricks... The result is that I am afraid to let you see the darkest part of me. Because you love me because you've seen the good side of me. Maybe if you saw the real side of me or, or, or the dark side of me, you might not love me anymore. And so even at church, we can have happy, plastic, smiling faces, putting on a front to each other. Why? Because we only want you to see the best of me because what would you do? If you saw the worst of me, what would you think of me if you knew the things I struggled with? What would I think of you if I knew the things you struggled with? Do you get what I'm saying? We build relationships in this world often on the superficial. Why? Because I'm scared to be vulnerable. Can I trust you with my vulnerability? Or will you mock me for it? Will you betray me to somebody else with it? What will you do if I'm completely open and honest with you? And then we do that same thing with God. Now, somewhere in the back of our minds, we know what the psalm says. Somewhere in the back of our minds, we know that he knows our words. We know that he knows all our days ahead of it. We, we, we know that he knows us, and yet we often project onto God and our connection with him the same dynamics that we experience with other people. If I'm completely honest with God, will he still love me? If I confess this deep, dark, gruesome, ugly, abhorrent side of me, that thing that you're even too afraid to admit in prayer, if I were to do that, if I were to be completely, brutally honest with God, would He still love me? Would He still accept me? Would He still forgive me? Or does there come a place with God where He goes, that, that is just over the top. That is just too far. You know what I love about this psalm? <laughs> this psalm tells me the only one I hurt when I refuse to be vulnerable with God, completely transparent and honest with God, the only one I hurt is me. Why? Because at the cross, he saw the ugliest part of the entirety of humanity. At the cross, the one who knew no sin, in the language of 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, the one who knew no sin became, became sin for us. There is no darker place than the cross. And he's been there. He drank the cup until it killed him. And he still loves us. What are we saying? 
We're saying that this God who died on the cross, when you give Him the darkest, ugliest part of what you are, you can absolutely count on the fact that He will never betray you, never mock you. He will always take it seriously because He's already done that at the cross. If there's one being in the universe that you can be absolutely vulnerable all of the time with, it's God. One place where you can be absolutely secure in the worst of your brokenness, in the hardness of your rebellion, it is the foot of the cross. It is this God who put you together, who formed you in your womb, who knows your days before you experience them, who understands the words on your tongue, who, who searches your heart, who knows your mind and stands your anxieties. This God is the God who upon the cross has performed a miracle outside of our works, outside of our little cities that we lock ourselves up in trying to protect ourselves and save ourselves and restore ourselves and find our happiness and our contentment and our joy and it only kills us. When you venture outside of that city and you say, I'm done with this, forget the walls, forget the gates, I'm going to be vulnerable, I'm going to trust myself to the God of the cross to the God who dies in my place, who has seen the darkest chapter of my life before I was even born, because that's what happens on the cross. Your sin has already been atoned for. He saw your life upon the cross. He went where you went, and He took your judgment. He's already seen the ugliest side of you that there is to see, the side you would not dare to show me or anybody else in this room. You might not even show your spouse, but He has already seen it. And get this, He still loves you. He still loves you. People might not still love you because we're shallow, but God is deep. Do not treat God like a man. Do not assume the failings of mankind to be the failings of God kind. Take the risk. Venture out of the city. There's a few beautiful memory verses that I've stored in my mind out of the book of Psalms which tie so beautifully to that story. Psalm 115 verses 7 and 8 says, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men, for He satisfies the longing soul and He fills the hungry soul with goodness. The next Psalm 116 verses 12 and 13 says, Save us from trouble for the help of man is useless. Through God we shall do valiantly for it is He who will tread down our enemies. Further along in the Psalms, another beautiful one. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. Leave your city. Leave your own devisings. Be vulnerable with God. Confess the darkness, the darkest part of you to God, and you will find that He feeds you with the bread from the table of heaven. You will find that He will hydrate you with the water that flows from the rock of heaven, you will find that you carry from the tents of the enemy, the place of affliction, you will carry treasure because God has redeemed you. He has saved you. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. Will you trust yourself to a God like this? Would you give Him your all? Would you surrender every fiber of your being or will you still stay inside of your little walls thinking that you can do it yourself? It's a place of bankruptness, a place of brokenness, a place of hunger, a place of starvation, a place of thirst. And it does not save in the end. There is one Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is one miracle above all miracles, the cross of Jesus Christ. There is a place where you have been known completely and totally, not just your smiling face, but the brokenness of your heart. There is a God who has loved you, 
despite the darkest part of your being, a God who desperately wants to spend eternity with you, despite what you are, because he sees in you not what you are, but what you might become in Christ. How would you turn away from a God like that? And sadly, many do. But surely, surely you and I, we will make the choice of Joshua that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen.